Chapter 17 Lions and Tigers As they entered the lion house, Phil noted with gladness of heart that people had only just begun to gather. He did not mean to be crowded out this time, whatever happened. It wants quite half an hour to feeding time, said Uncle. Are we to wait here all the while? Yes, please, said Joan. Then you can tell us about them before the meat comes in. I see. Well, what do you want to know? All about the lions, please, said Joan calmly. That's a pretty tall order. I can tell you a few things about them because I happen to have hunted them. As for telling you all about them... They were standing opposite the first cage, and the lion appeared to be asleep. As Uncle spoke, the lordly creature looked up, rubbed his face with his paw, and winked. Winked. Everybody was sure about it. Uncle laughed. Perhaps he means he's heard that yarn before. No doubt a lot of people say they have... The lion winked again. Or was he only... Worried by a fly. Well, whatever Mr Lyon chooses to think, I really have seen him, or his kind, under very different conditions. And on the whole, he's not at all a bad sort. In the daytime, anyway. This time the lion looked him full in the face. Oh, all right, old chap. We won't say much about your prowls at night. You don't like those times discussed. It would be hitting beneath the belt, wouldn't it? The lion had closed his eyes. Apparently, he was no longer interested. The lion, said Uncle, is called the King of Beasts. I'd better say that first, because he's listening and expects it. All the same, a great deal of nonsense has been written about him. And other animals are often far more courageous. But a lion with a full mane, like our friend here, is certainly very handsome and awe-inspiring. As a matter of fact, though, the majority of the lions one comes across in Africa, they are still very plentiful in the wilder and less populated parts of the Dark Continent, have not anything like such good manes as the lions you see in menageries and zoos like this. Neither are their coats so hairy, except perhaps in the case of animals who live in the higher and colder parts, Generally, the lion of the plain and the rocks has only a few tufts of hair here and there, and he's much more restless and active than he seems here, or than the majority of pictures and photographs suggest. We have already seen that his tawny coat matches the sandy deserts, and you may often be quite close to a lion without suspecting his presence. Their eyes, too, are quite different in freedom. They have something of the fascination of a snake, and when a lion has been wounded and is at bay, his eyes flash and glow like dancing balls of fire. Have you killed many lions? asked Phil, breathless. After all, that was what mattered. I don't think I'd better say. Sometimes lions have to be killed. Otherwise, no other animal could live. I have known of one who killed over a hundred pigs in a single night. Sometimes, too, as they grow old and their teeth are worn, they become man-eaters. For strange as it may seem to us, they find man, unarmed man that is, an easier prey than most of the beasts of the field. Once a lion tastes human blood, he will want more. And child after child, woman after woman, perhaps man after man, will disappear from a native village. Then there is only one thing to be done. You cannot argue with a man-eater, whether he be lion or tiger. But for the most part, I am bound to say... The lions one catches sight of in the daytime are only too glad to slink away. This one hasn't any mane, said Joan, as they stood outside the next cage. This is Mrs Lion. It is only the males who have manes. She is very faithful to her lord and master, and is generally devoted to her little ones. No one in his senses would willingly attack a lioness with her cubs. The young ones are playful creatures, like very heavy kittens, and so be safely petted for a time. 
Lions are very intelligent and have been taught to do many tricks, like riding bicycles. But personally, I dislike very much seeing animals made to do things that are unnatural and obviously distasteful to them. A prolonged yawn, finishing with a sort of growl, came from the cage beyond. Ah, the tiger is getting hungry. Let us pass along and look at him before too many people collect. But we shall lose our places, said Phil. I want to see the lions fed. I want to see the tigers fed, said Joan. I want to see the leopard fed. And the other thing, said Kitty. You mean the cheetah? Well, you'll have to split up. And no doubt half of you will get lost. Better stick together a little longer and then we'll see. I rather think the keepers begin at the tiger's end. So they all moved along and looked at the tigers. And the tigers looked at them. Hard. I always think the tiger is a finer looking creature than the lion, said Uncle. Phil noticed that he had not said that while they stood in front of the lion. He lives for the most part in the hot jungles of India and a few other parts of Asia and his stripes harmonise exactly with the waving blades of grass and other undergrowth. Though they have such beautiful coats, the tigers here are rather scraggy creatures. Out of the jungle with plenty of food and plenty of exercise in getting that food, they are much fatter and their muscles are like steel. A single blow from the powerful paw of a tiger will strike a native's arm from the shoulder so that it hangs only by a piece of skin. He looks awfully fierce, said Alice. He is fierce. Sometimes he terrorises a whole village so that the people dare not go near their homes. Tiger hunting in certain parts of India is a favourite sport. The hunters are mounted on elephants, which have to be specially trained for the purpose. For an ordinary elephant, big and powerful as he is, will generally run from a tiger. Uncle had to break off his lecture there. I doubt whether anybody but Phil had heard the last part of it. There were other things much more interesting to attend to. People were now entering in great numbers and all the creatures in the cages, knowing very well what this meant, were growing more and more excited. Every now and again there would be a fierce and echoing howl such as the children had heard outside on their first visit and the animals paced restlessly to and fro, getting more impatient every minute. At last came a clanking of heavy iron bars. And two keepers appeared with a hand barrow, piled high with chunks of raw meat. First of all, a lioness, who had been with her lord, was induced to go into a separate cage, and a sliding door was dropped. That's to keep them apart during dinner, said Uncle. Otherwise the lion might think his mate had a larger or juicier joint and there would be a fight over it. I know some other households where such an argument, but no one was listening. Who could listen with all that row? The children were well in the front row and could see everything beautifully. Indeed, Phil need not have been so anxious about the crowd after all because... A lot of people preferred to watch from the raised steps on the other side of the building and there was plenty of room by the railing. But of course Kitty had to be lifted up and from Uncle's shoulders she saw better than anybody. Slowly the keepers came down the barrier, pausing at each cage in turn to fork in a far from dainty morsel. And as each animal was reached and settled down to the feast, the din was hushed and a gradual silence stole through the building. At last, nothing could be heard, but the subdued questions and exclamations of children, the leisurely licks of rasping tongues, and later the crunching of bone. Kitty got down from her perch and heaved a sigh of satisfaction. It seems like we've had our own dinners, doesn't it? She said, only I couldn't eat that olible stuff. But five minutes later, she wanted her tea.